Hello again. This is a bittersweet moment because it's our closing plenary session entitled The Future of Work, The Future of Cities, Emerging Lessons of COVID-19. We started our forum with the opening plenary on connecting education to employment in the age of COVID-19. And now we close our event focusing on the future of work and the future of our cities. I ask you to consider the relationship between these two themes. I raise the question, does connecting education to employment help determine the future of work and the future of our cities? A significant challenge of our time. To bring clarity to this imposing question and other issues, we're honored to have such an esteemed group of thought leaders. Here we have, a diverse, we, here we have diverse perspectives from leaders in business, city planning, education, and city government, considering the life-changing impact of COVID-19. I'm pleased to welcome and introduce my good friend, Matt Wonder, who is the distinguished leader of the nationally acclaimed Da Vinci Schools in Los Angeles, and I'm proud to say a board member of Schools that Can. A quick reminder, at the end of this session, there'll be a very brief closing to our forum. So if you can, please stay on for an extra 10 minutes. I also note you'll receive very brief online survey, and we would very much appreciate your taking just a few minutes and give us feedback on your forum experience. Matt, it's truly an honor to have you joining us today. Thank you very much, Michael. It's a privilege to moderate such a distinguished panel on such a critical and timely topic. Panelists, the, the internet abounds with your accomplishments and contributions, but I wish to introduce all of you in a way that, in a way that might not find on the web. Rahul Reddy, a protege who worked under Phil Rosenfeld as in-house legal counsel at the Department of Education said, Phil's online biography describes his tremendous career but it does not fully capture his positive and down to earth spirit. Phil was also so approachable, whether it be for a discussion about a pressing legal assignment or his many passions like baseball or music. I truly benefited working closely with such an inspiring and compassionate and thoughtful leader. Ambassador Frank Baxter is the former CEO at the Jeffries Group a multinational investment bank and financial services company. U.S. and U.S. ambassador to Uruguay, and most importantly, a great human who has positively changed the trajectory of tens of thousands of lives through his service on dozens of at the intersection of education and employment. With a focus on supporting youth and young adults in career exploration and advancement, David not only has the pioneering spirit that led him to create the New York uh, Center for Youth Employment, but he also brings a unique intellectual curiosity to his work. Last but not least, as the co-CEO of the leading architectural design firm, M Andy Cohen is much more than a better version of younger Richard Gere. He leads Gensler with exceptional strategy, execution, optimism, wisdom, and incomparable work ethic. So let's dive into some content by framing this session using a recent Gensler client letter entitled, Welcoming the Change with Determined Optimism, which shared, quote, the world is transforming before our eyes and time has new meaning. Speed and agility own the day as what once was a distant future has arrived overnight. Every conversation we have with clients, partners, and experts brings a renewed perspective and an adjusted lens to see our world and our future world. Distinguished panelists, we are excited to learn from you what is likely to emerge for cities, the future of work and workplaces, and how education aligns to these changes. Andy, you talked in an earlier session about the future of cities. Can you please elaborate on what the future might look like both in America and across the globe in the age of COVID-19 and what the role of education might be in determining that outcome? 
Thanks so much, Matt, and congratulations again to Michael Druckmann for putting together this unbelievable conference. Really, really well done. You know, my firm, is, as Matt was saying, is really focused on redefining the future of cities and framing the issue around the future of education. And as my fellow uh, panelists have said, you cannot have a great city without a great education, without great education. This is a milestone moment, a pivot point in the history of the future in the world. And it really is focused on cities. And why cities? Why are they so important? Because the first time in human history, more people live in cities than not, over 50%. By 2050, 70% of the world's populations will be in cities. And 80% of the world's GDP is in cities. And what we've been focused on is how design and design thinking has a profound role in making a difference in the world. And I was taken by what the schools at Cannes program around design thinking. Uh, there was a great program that focused on with the kids and 90% of the students learned to use design thinking in that process, which was phenomenal. And every day, every day, we're impacting millions of people's lives, how we live, how we educate, how we work and how we play. And it's focused on the human experience, on the education experience and creating visceral, real experiences not like what we're on right now, we're inside a computer box, but real, tangible, authentic experiences. You know, we're faced with incredible challenges around the globe. And my firm and the world is focused on these global challenges. And the biggest one of all, that's what we're going through right now with this coronavirus, is focused on resilience. And this is global resilience. And the idea around global health and safety, which is so paramount right now, but also on and connected to, really importantly, climate change, because this is the preclude to climate change if we don't change our ways over the next 10 years. You know, so you know why it's so important to an architect and a designer. 50% of all CO2 created in the world is buildings, not automobiles, not industry, but buildings. So we are focused on a sustainable future for our schools. You know, most schools in the next three to five years, will, new schools will be designed to be net zero. And that's really important. Net zero means they don't emit any of their own energy. And that is the future of sustainability built into our schools and for our children to learn about sustainability. Um, you know, we, the future of cities is really dependent on the future of education. And I mentioned this on this other panel I was on. We did a survey, a home survey, that talked about working from home and would, would you go back to work or not for workers? What we got came away with was 12% of people said they would want to stay home. 38% said that they would work from home one to three days. 50% of workers would go back to work. And yet we did a survey of parents sending kids back to school. And what came back was 36% yes, we'll send the kids back to school right now. 20% said maybe, and an overwhelming 45% said no. And the point of that is, is that school is so important because people need to stay home for child care if the schools are not open. And that connection is vital as we re reassembly, reentry the workplace. This pandemic really laid bare to the inequities in our education system and a shift to online distancing learning. And the issues were around technology and lack of connection and student engagement and attendance and privacy issues for the kids that are working from home. The future, I believe, and we believe, is all about hybrid learning, the idea of real-time online learning and in-school learning. We call ubiquitous technology with cameras and microphones built into schools so you have this whole digital flexible environment uh, that's real-time because we believe in a, creating these experiential learning environments, what I call, and Matt knows, inclusive architecture. And if I have time later, I'll talk about it, but it's just creating a setting that supports dynamic collaborative learner-centered protocols. Thanks, Matt. Andy, thank you so much. Phil, I know you're fascinated with issues concerning the future of work and how education fits into that future and even conduct orientation sessions at the U.S. Department of Education on the subject. How do you see the connection between education and the workplace in the future, especially in the age of COVID-19 and what can we do to enhance this connection? So thank you, Matt. And thank you, Michael Druckmann, for this amazing set of sessions. 
Um, I'm honored to be here, and I've been honored to listen and hear such great sessions throughout the three days of this conference. Preparing students for the future of work has been a passion of mine, as you said. I teach a course in it to new employees every two weeks at the Department of Education. And education prepares our students for the work of the future, for jobs 5, 10, 15, 20 years from now, jobs that may not even exist now in industries that don't exist now, that will soon be invented. The rate of change is that accelerated, especially after COVID-19. So how does education go about it? The K-12 system is based on an 18th century Prussian model of Frederick the Great in an industrial revolution early stage. And it had one way to teach one size of classrooms, one timeline for everybody to learn. It doesn't work as well today as it did then. It's something that both Secretary Arne Duncan and Secretary Betsy DeVos agreed on that the Prussian model is outdated. Our universities are also often based on systems 100 or 200 years old. They also need upgrading and changing. That doesn't mean we don't have great educators, great students, great teachers, great administrators. I saw them in just about every session we had. But we need to do better. Recent test scores show that our results are flat in reading, math, science, history, civics, geography. The gaps are growing, unfortunately, um, from low income to um, people at higher income levels. We need to do better. At the Department of Ed, we're encouraged every day to rethink and reimagine education and try to provide more choice, more learning styles taken care of, more ways, more places, more times to get education. And that is what we really need now in the COVID-19 environment and in what's to come. So how have we done COVID-19 era? Results seem mixed. Some schools, some school districts, some teachers got up and running quickly. Some could not and lost valuable learning time. Some students were excited and some were bored. Some are suing their universities for getting tuition back. We shouldn't be hard on ourselves, but this is a wake-up call to change. Technology offers online learning that's personalized at cases that each individual could help set uh, for the way in which they learn, whether it be visual or um, from sounds, um, all different types of teaching. We need to learn from what we've gone through and are going through and do better in the future. Blended learning, apprenticeships that work, new ways of doing business and learning that we've heard about at this conference. We need to get that word out throughout the country. In the past, when we've had plagues, challenges, wars, we've learned. We've modernized cities, we improved sanitation, we developed the movie industry, telephones, radio, television. After Sputnik, we focused on getting to the moon within a few years, and we focused and we did it. We could do that again. We're reliant on each other. We're resilient. We can work together to do better in the future, and this is our call to do it. I've heard optimism at the conference. I've heard pessimism. I've heard, don't work through the system. We can't change it. Go around it. But you can change it, and you could also work through the system. There's money available now at the state, federal, and local level. We provided money often to experiment provided lots of flexibility. Often it doesn't get claimed. The flexibility doesn't get used. And unfortunately, we stay with the same old, same old. 
In our new Elementary and Secondary Act, parents are mentioned 48 times, community 187 times, parents 378 times, teachers 460, students 511. There is a place for all of them in reshaping education. And we need to take the opportunities that the system offers and also work to innovate the system. This is a perfect time after COVID-19 to really get at that more perfect union that our constitution talks about. I look forward to hearing the other panelists and thank you for listening to how I think we're doing connecting work and education. Apologies for that. Frank, similarly, um, can you please share what you think the future of education might look like in the age of COVID-19 from your perspective as a founder of the largest network of schools in Los Angeles? Thank you very much, uh, Matt. It's humbling to be in this distinguished panel. This conference really has been a treasure trove of, uh, trove of ideas and actions for helping people, young and old, to learn how to maximize their lives, their liberty, and their pursuit of happiness. With, and I'm, I'm humbled by in this, particularly hearing Phil, I, I agree with him so much, but, but, but witnessing so many of the participants committing their lives, your lives, to helping others to find their purpose is a source of great optimism for me. The real challenge is scaling. Uh, a more general source of optimism, which Phil touched on, is being part of a very, we're part of a very adaptable species. We've survived and eventually thrived through eons of poverty, disease, war, oppression, bad weather, and who knows what else. Although we are now feeling fear, sadness and uncertainty, the odds are that we will eventually emerge from this crisis in a better place. For now, we must live with much uncertainty, which is very uncomfortable. We don't have good answers for how long the virus will last or what the economy will do. We need a lot of humility to accept our, our ignorance. Noted investor Howard Bark says that there are two types of people, those who don't know and those who don't know they don't know. I hope I'm in the right category. Uh, we do know a few things, good and bad. We've learned that our communications infrastructure, as we just heard, is inadequate in many places, especially for low-income students. That must be corrected. We have learned that while lectures may not be the best form of transmitting knowledge, they are not improved by being online. Online presentations need to be more interesting and engaging. Uh, we've had uh, chances to learn about more effective uh, learning systems and focusing on education to work. I've been involved with the beginning of a school system called Portal, which has competency-based learning, blended learning. It's working with an excellent distance learning university, and it will effectively merge high school and college. The first school will be located at the headquarters of a technology company uh, for, uh, about learning about work. Students starting in the ninth grade will be able to graduate from high school and get an AA degree in four years and a BA degree in five years. This is one of the many examples that are out there, many of the many points of light in education. What we also know is that we entered the crisis already behind, as Phil said. We have a system that hasn't changed fundamentally since Horace Mann adopted the one-size-fits-all oppression system in, in was 1823. We, or 1832, excuse me. We know that learning has been divided into time periods in which teachers and students must try to fit. Uh, we have known that this, since the Nation at Risk report in 1983, that we are not doing as well in reading, math, et cetera, as Phil said, as many other developed countries. And we spend more money per student than any one of them. As we go back to school, we know the economic challenge will be as daunting as the academic challenge. In my state of California, the governor has said that we will have to cut K-14 funding by 18%. This week, six school districts said they wouldn't be able to operate under those conditions. Maybe something we've learned during the shutdown, shutdown could help us adapt to tight financial conditions. At least one system is using master teachers to teach many more students at once, 
digitally, but backed up with assistance to help with individual problems. As we get back to normal, whatever that means, there may be more room for what has been shared here and what has been learned during the forced distance learning. But we can't be satisfied with only pockets of excellence. Powerful forces fight to maintain the status quo. Those who care about more effective learning must get better at advocacy. Democracy is not a spectator sport. This is starting to happen as teacher-based organizations such as Educators for Excellence and Speak Up are forming. Good ideas are only good if they are executed. In summation for me, this is a time that we must all work for a student-centered system. We adults are important, but only insofar as we enhance the learning experience for all students. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ambassador. David, we turn to you as the founder of the Center for Youth Employment in New York City in the mayor's office. You have a unique perspective on both the issues of future of work and the future of cities. How do you see the future of both in the age of COVID-19 and how do they impact each other? Well, thanks, Matt. Um, and uh, thank you to Michael Druckmann and everybody uh, at Schools That Can and congratulations on uh, what's really been a wonderful conference with a lot of amazing information and maybe more important right now, a lot of community and inspiration for all of us who are looking for the way forward. So the theory of why cities have prospered in the knowledge economy uh, is that the proximity makes it easy for smart people to easily interact with each other, evolve their ideas and get what they need in terms of money and talent to bring those ideas to life. Uh, it's an ecosystem that's designed to replenish itself through influxes of both financial capital and human capital. And I think as a general point, it's probably fair to say that knowledge economy activities are the core of the urban economy, accounting both for the bulk of the tax base and much of the identity of the modern city. Meanwhile, there's a whole related sector of economic activity that largely functions to serve that knowledge economy and its workers. I mean, I, I work in Lower Manhattan or worked in Lower Manhattan. <laughs> uh, and I think about all the restaurants and bars and flower shops and gyms and specialized retail and everything else that you find in and around central business districts like that. Now, how much of that will change as a result of COVID-19 is really open to question. I think part of it is that we don't know what's necessary to make the secret sauce. Do you need millions of people commuting into these economic hubs every single day? And if not, what does that mean for all that other economic activity that depends on that model and the people who work there? Now, regarding the future of work, uh, let me suggest that we don't have one economy, we have three. I mentioned two of them just now, the knowledge economy and the service economy. And the third one is what we might call the economy of growing and making stuff. Uh, and this is sort of the mythical American economy. If you think about an American worker in the 19th century, the image that's gonna to come to mind is an agricultural worker, a farmer. If you think about an American worker in the 20th century, the middle part of the 20th century anyway, you're gonna think of somebody in the industrial economy. Um, but as technology around growing and making things improves, employment shrinks even as production goes up. Um, we saw that in agriculture starting in the late 19th century. We saw that in manufacturing over the second half of the 20th century. And now that same trend is starting to work through the service economy because of automation. Now, history and basic capitalist theory suggest that in the long term, technology advances do improve the general welfare as capital is reallocated and things get more efficient. But the pain shows up before the gain. Uh, and in the short term, automation is already in the process of destroying or transforming jobs at the low end of the labor market. Right now, that's things like retail clerks and dishwashers. In a decade or two, it might be commercial drivers. Um, but if you look at the numbers, and McKinsey's done a lot of research on this, uh, among others, you know, you, you could see 40 to 50% of jobs involving tasks that can be automated. And what concerns me is that a lot of these jobs, you know, they are mostly low paying. They don't necessarily offer a great deal of security or advancement, um, but they did by and large pay enough to meet the basic needs of food and shelter. If they're gonna disappear, it means we need to do one of two things. We either have to make a massive change in the safety net, an expansion of the safety net, 
so we can cover more of those basic needs through redistribution. Or we have to make a massive change in education so more young people will be competitive for and ultimately help create more good jobs, mostly in the knowledge economy. Now, policymakers have some agency here. If you know there's going to be a disruption at the low end of the labor market that will play out over the next 20 years or so, there are actions you can take now to support the current workers who are going to be effective, uh, affected and actions you can take to prepare the future workers, by which I mean young people in education systems, the folks that Ambassador Baxter was talking about, for the opportunities that you believe are coming. But this really requires intention and choice and commitment. Market forces alone aren't going to solve these problems. And the old model of education and training uh, that, that, that we've heard discussed, which really goes back 200 years and more, um, is not going to fix it on its own. And what's really interesting to me right now is I think that if you look at these trends, there's a strong argument that long term, the risks of inaction are larger than the risks of disruption through the significant changes that we need. Fascinating, David. Thank you so much. Um, the next question is for, for each of you. Um, one of my heroes is uh, Southern New Hampshire University President Paul LeBlanc, who asserts Talent is equally distributed, but opportunity is not. With all the changes caused by our adjustments to this pandemic and the staggering unemployment, will we be able to eventually close the opportunity gap? Um, Frank, may we send it to you, please? Yes, thanks, Matt. Uh, I think the, the, uh, with the qualification, the answer is yes. We're, right now, uh, we have a university system that is really bifurcated the, the top only the top five percent to get into the elite colleges but schools like southern new hampshire university like arizona state university like purdue like maryland are saying that a lot more people are qualified and there are ways of get them of, of, of getting them through and there's going to be a vast growth of, of broader universities right now only eight percent of low-income students actually graduate from from uh, from college we can change that and and we're, we're we're on the verge of changing it now i think it's really important thank you david may we ask you to share your thoughts on the opportunity gap as well or potential yeah um i mean the short answer and maybe not a super satisfying answer is it depends uh by which i mean that it depends on the story we collectively tell ourselves about the pandemic how much of the suffering right now is bad luck beyond human agency and how much of it is the consequence of choices that we've made through action or inaction and that we're free to reconsider if we'd like to do that. Uh, I think it also depends on how people with policymaking authority define their jobs. If the top priority, uh, and I'll, you know, I'll, I'll confess to my bias, I think it should be, is uh, set conditions to help the largest number of people have the strongest opportunity for lives of dignity and economic security that requires making changes like strengthening the safety net, improving systems that develop human capital, uh, more aggressively regulating markets so that they function fairly. If the priority is protect concentrated wealth and power against potential disruptions, you're going to see very different choices made. And I worry at times that the, the economic polarization that we see now has created so much distance between the people who are suffering and the people who are empowered to ease their suffering that even well-intentioned policymakers might miss the moment and will fail either to ease the immediate pain, fail to address the underlying factors. Again, we have a degree of control over what happens. If we want to close the opportunity gap, I think we need to focus on two compelling arguments. The first is that equalizing opportunity would contribute to sustainable growth. It's just a more efficient way to maximize the talent available. And the second is that it would square with our professed values about the society we aspire to be. Thank you. And Andy, the same question to you, the opportunity gap. Um, do we have an opportunity to close it in this uh, um, uh, coming out of this crisis? Yeah, I want to frame it around the opportunities before us. And the opportunities are immense. You know, the whole idea that I put forward in my opening was around resilience and around how right now what we're going through is global health and wellness and obviously climate change. And I think 
green jobs are the future. There's going to be a massive retooling of the U.S. and all global city. And these jobs will be blue collar jobs, white collar jobs, all types of jobs all around the resiliency of our future, the very future of the human race. And so I believe you're going to see massive amount of green jobs coming on the market. The second area that you've just seen over the last couple of months is the idea of local versus global. And you're going to see the supply chain massively change over the next year or two, where more jobs are going to be back being brought back locally. Just look at what we went through with just the PPE alone and how we had to beg for masks from China. That supply chain and every type of job across the broad spectrum of all types of workers is going to bring jobs back locally. And we need to chain, train and teach our children around that. I, although I agree with technology is going to replace jobs, I also think technology is going to create jobs. I look at my business in architecture and design and uh, you know, augmented reality and virtual reality and computational design and the wonderful session that you all just had before me and us. Computational design is huge and we're hiring right now computational designers. So I see the technology and the world of technology is a massive opportunity. And the last piece is the retooling of our cities. Our cities are going to massively change. I, I, I should speak just a minute about the driverless car that's going to be before us in 10 to 15 years. That's going to change the infrastructure of our cities. We're going to have to you know, create uh, walkable pedestrian environments. You know, streets are going to be closed off. There's going to be lots of opportunities for different types of jobs and amenities in our cities of the future. Thanks, Matt. Randy. And Phil, you're, you're batting cleanup on this one because um, your distinguished career has been all about um, making sure the haves and have nots that gap closes. So your thoughts on this? So I'm very optimistic that we will <laughs> learn from this experience. We saw how interconnected we are, that if one person um, gets afflicted by COVID-19, it could easily spread. And we have such a more greater understanding of how we're interconnected and related through this. And I think we've learned, we've seen so many heroes coming out from all aspects of society, uh, the federal, state, local, public, private. We've seen mayors and governors step up and really meet the challenges. I think we've seen people from every walk of life, grocery stores, um, drivers, all kinds of people being heroes. And I think we will realize that we are resilient, as others have said. There's no one answer uh, that will come from the federal state or local government. It's all of us working together with public and private to make technology more affordable, almost like a utility, which seems to happen after other types of disasters. We realize what we need to give everybody a base of health, opportunity, and connectedness. So I think we're going to learn a lot of lessons from this that are really positive. And it'll result in greater equity, understanding that we're all connected, that if somebody's sick, our chances are greater that we're gonna get sick. And we will care for each other even more than we have in the past. And that's the pattern after the Spanish flu, adult education thrived as a result. And I think we'll understand that we need technology and lifelong learning to keep up with the fast pace of our society. So I'm very optimistic. You're on mute, Matt. On mute, Matt. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, this is a question aimed to you, Andy. Um, uh, at least at first, will mid-sized cities like Pittsburgh with a strong research and technology community grow in importance due to COVID-19? Absolutely. I, and I see all mid-sized small cities. This is an opportunity for, 
for recasting and reformulating a vision for the future. So the technological cities, the smart cities, uh, the cities that are ahead of the curve in innovation will come out of this even stronger, I believe. The ones that have really put down the groundwork for um, you know, innovation. Example of it is, I'll, I'll give you an example, is uh, you know, Uber and the driverless car technology is already available in Pittsburgh already. And so, you know, mid-sized, smaller cities, smaller communities have that opportunity to really promote the latest in technologies, the latest in innovations, and really fire up, um, you know, the people in those cities for the future. Thank you so much. Any of our panelists uh, wish to address this? There are many other questions. I'll, I will ask another. So. Um, researchers uh, Wiggins and McTeague uh, posit that schools ought to teach in school what students need to know when they get out of school. Um, what knowledge and skills must students uh, attain in this now changed world and a world that continues to change before us? Frank, do you mind tackling that one? Uh, I'll I'll start. I know I'm on the UC Berkeley Foundation Board, and now that we uh, just required that all students learn data science, feeling that's a language that regardless whether you're a musician or an artist or, or uh, a teacher, that, that that's, a, that's a means of communicating. So I think, and I think that should probably start in kindergarten. Thank you. And David, this is really at the intersection of uh, your work. Do you mind sharing? Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, I think there's a case to be made that somewhere around 1985, uh, around the time of uh, A Nation at Risk, uh, which Ambassador Baxter referenced a little earlier, um, we started to lose the plot a little bit as far as the purpose of K-12 education. It went from prepare students for the world beyond school to prepare students to get into college and they'll figure it out there. Now, and we saw college admissions rates really rise. Uh, we didn't so much see college persistence and completion rates rise, at least not among the lower income students uh, who are probably probably most in need of, the, of those credentials. Uh, but even many of those who do finish college, who make it through, who earn the degree, um, aren't truly ready for the world of work. Uh, Employers are surveyed from time to time on whether young, whether they think young workers are, are really ready to step in and they consistently report back that they fall short on key competencies like professionalism and communications. Uh, and we also see enormous disparity of earnings between graduates of big public systems like the City University of New York uh, and, and, and private colleges. Just one year after graduation, uh, a CUNY graduate is statistically likely to be making about fifteen thousand dollars less than uh, somebody from a from a prestigious private school. Now, I don't think any of us would say that's owing to talent. It owes to opportunities and connection. The the rate of internships among CUNY students is also around ten percent nationally for college students. I think it's closer to closer to fifty percent. Um, so in New York City, we're, we're trying to address this by more closely aligning the systems of K-12 education, post-secondary education, and youth workforce programming, an initiative we call Career Ready NYC. Uh, starting in middle school, I think we, we need to be helping young people determine their political career and their potential career interests and their emerging identities as economic actors. Um, Matt, Sorry. Pardon me? Yeah. Thank Sorry. you, David. Oh, you faded a little bit, so um, thank you for that <laughs> wonderful response. And Phil, do you mind addressing this great question from Norton from Pittsburgh? Yes. Um, yeah, I definitely want to. Um, I think we need to look at the graduates who enter the workforce and ask them the question, do they feel prepared for the job they're doing? That's why I uh, participate in orientation every two weeks. I ask that question. I want to find out whether the education system they feel has gotten them ready. I asked my nephew, who was an um, image coordinator for a hip-hop station, 
He went to college, had a really good education. I asked him, did it prepare you for your job, for your life? And he said, absolutely not. And pointed out lots of different things that could have been provided more individualized, more flexibility. So I think schools need to ask their graduates, did they give them an education that prepared them? And part of the preparation is to prepare them for change, agility, resilience, to keep learning uh, that it doesn't stop in the classroom when they graduate. Um, there's lots of alternatives, there's lots of relearning that needs to be done. And I think schools could get input from their graduates on how they could do better and keep getting that input to do better and better to prepare people for the life ahead. So um, I think we need to teach people how to constantly learn, not just be specialized, but have higher thinking skills that we heard about at this conference and be ready for change and adaptability and resilience. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, Frank. I think one thing that, that uh, Purdue is doing that would make the connection a lot better instead of having uh, the students depend on, on student loans that they're actually taking or they, they have investors taking an equity interest so that uh, the, the college is repaid based on uh, how well the student does, how well the student's income is, it might make you, the colleges pay a little bit more attention to what the students need to provide them outside of college. Yeah. Andy, I'm sure you have much to share on this given the 6,500 uh, folks that you employ at Gensburg. Yeah, thanks, Matt. I mean, you know, the world is accelerating and changing at a blistering pace. And tomorrow's problems must be solved by the students of today. And what I find is CEO of a global company, I could tell you the skills, the special skills are really important, the soft skills, collaborative creativity, collaborative design thinking, communication skills, you know, the soft skills, the emotional intelligence. When we hire young people now, it's about emotional intelligence, interpersonal, communication, creativity, all those words come to mind as much as the expertise, it's those soft skills that really matter to companies today, I will tell you. And it's our responsibility in helping students leverage their skills, interests, and passions so they're prepared for the future world. Thank you so much. Um, can you please talk about, uh, you have watched um, these other great sessions um, and you're the concluding um, group of distinguished panelists um, at the forum. Do you mind spending a little bit of time talking about what you see um, are some key takeaways that our viewers um, should know and um, what action steps they might be able to take? And again, in this context, are you optimistic about this? Um, David, may we, um, may we send that to you, please? Yeah, I, I mean, I've, I've described myself at times, and I suspect this is true of a lot of people who are in this field as uh, an involuntary optimist. I kind of feel like I'm, I'm, I'm doomed to hope. Uh, and if you look at the broad sweep of history, really what's happened in the last 200 years, you know, we have a world that is richer, that is more literate, uh, that is better educated, that is more democratic, that is more empowered uh, than I think anybody could have imagined 200 years ago. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, that, that should be bracing and affirming in moments when we need it. That said, it doesn't just happen. You know, the wheel, the wheel of history doesn't just move. You gotta, you gotta turn it. Uh, and I feel like everything that we have heard in this conference, you know, probably strengthens our muscles to help to help turn it to make sure that opportunity continues to expand that we have these systems which traditionally have been disconnected, you know, education over here and career readiness and work experience over here, you gotta bring them together because especially for low income young people, which is where the Center for Youth Employment focuses, they aren't necessarily going to have the tools and resources to make that meaning on their own. They need to be 
really supported and empowered to do that. Thank you so much. Phil? Trying to unmute myself. Um, I am, I'm very optimistic, um, but I have to say that during the three days of the conference, um, I have had difficulty sleeping. And the reason is I saw such exciting programs during the day and I was interspersing it with my work and sometimes being on two meetings at the same time. And I also see a kind of disconnect that we offered quite a bit of money in the COVID-19 aftermath through things like the CARES Act passed by government. Um, in the past, we've offered a great deal of flexibility for pilot programs. They often don't get claimed. And there's a bit of a disconnect with some of the great ideas I'm hearing here. How could we spread those ideas throughout the country? How could money that's out there match up with these great ideas so that they could be scaled even greater than they are now. That's what I was losing sleep over in the past two days. And I kept thinking, what could come out of this conference that will really make a difference? I think we're at, as each of the panelists have said, a very, very important turning point. We have a chance to learn and kind of reset and relearn. The system has a lot of money and resources available that could be repurposed for some of the problems that we're hearing about and how we connect with the post-COVID-19 um, experience and challenge. We need to spread the information, maybe um, a number of the resources that came out of this conference could be put online and made available and we can all share more what's working um, and how we face the challenges and what resources are available from federal, state, local, public, and private. Um, I just hope we rededicate ourselves to using what we have better to fund the ideas that we heard about today even better than they are. Um, I hope I can fall asleep better after this conference feeling that we are going to achieve that and keep the momentum going from this conference. Thanks. Thank you so much, Bill. Frank, what do you see as our takeaways? I get a tremendous amount of optimism when I walk through our charter schools uh, here in LA. We have 28 middle and high schools, 13,000 students. They, they, cut, they come in from the, the regular schools four years behind, yet 95% graduate uh, and are accepted in, in college more are going to college more are graduating from college what tremendous assets they are we should use we should fully exploit every one of those assets and we can but i think what i said earlier my early response i mean policy makers are fine but we need to have the grassroots we can't be uh talking about these great little ideas which are, are wonderful we've got to be advocates we've got to join join groups and change the policy makers the policy makers quite frequently are locked into uh, people that have an interest in maintaining the status quo. So I think if what I get out of it is more energy to get out and, and be, get on the barricades and, and get to get our leaders to, to get more in line and think about the kids rather than other adults. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And Andy, what you, Andy. Um, what would you like um, any of our viewers to take away from um, the whole conference, from what uh, the work you do, from what you would like to share? Thanks, Matt. You know, when it comes to life's challenges, we often stand at a crossroads. We're at one of those key crossroads in life right now. Yes, living in a coronavirus world feels out of control. These are very, very challenging and disorienting times. And we know everyone is making personal sacrifices. At this pivotal point in history, I see a fantastic mindset coming out in our people and around the world of determined optimism. You see, we have a choice choosing to face this moment in life through determined optimism. It fills our life with great purpose and meaning. 
to create a better, safer, greater opportunity for world for all, for our children and our children's children. And I'll just finish with a quote that from JFK that I love. We have the opportunity to put our we have the opportunity to put our hands on the arc of history and bend it towards the future that we collectively choose. Thanks, Matt. Beautiful. Thank so you. I think we probably have time for, for one more question. As we think about connecting the education to employment pipeline, a question from Danny <laughs> out there says, what does doing better look like beyond test scores? What ought kids know, need to know and be able to do in schools? And what, what might be alternative assessment to our more standardized test scores from the perspective of um, having careers of jobs of the future? Who would like to take that first? Phil, may I'll we put you on the screen? Oh, please, Andy, Frank. Uh, I'll just repeat what Andy said. Uh, Develop the soft skills. Learn, uh, learn how to interact with your people. Thank you. Bill, your thoughts? Yes, um, a couple of things. Um, I would like, um, going forward, people to know better about our system and its possibilities. Uh, the fact that our civic scores and our knowledge of our history and our government are so low is really disappointing. Uh, people may complain about the system and the politics, but if they don't know about how it works and how they can participate and be a meaningful voice, then they're just letting other people govern. And that's not what our system is. Um, we're a system that everybody participates that's why it has so much promise. It has survived a number of wars and disasters. It has so much potential. We have to grab that potential. The education has to educate us to be better members of the public, participants in our government, decision makers, and feel like school has prepared us for that future ahead. And each individual can do their part to learn more about how their government really works and what's available and how they can participate and not leave it to others and be um, pessimistic that, well, politics will never change. I think this is a perfect time to rise above politics, participate, and make it, as I was saying before, the more perfect union that was promised and we continue to work towards, but now we could get there in great leaps and bounds by learning and participating. Thank you, Phil. David, this is a, another question in your sweet spot. Um, I wanna add on to the question from, a, um, from Beth, who also asked, how do we equitably redistribute power? And she's talking about voice and choice here. Um, um, and especially, uh, as it's aimed towards our young people. Yeah, thanks, Matt. I mean, I, I have I have two thoughts on this, and one is sort of the you know, I guess the individual level answer, and one is the the system answer. And I I know we're we're kind of running toward the end of our time, so I'm going to try to say something complicated quickly and clearly, and we'll see we'll see how that goes. Uh, the first question, sort of, what's the metric? Um, I don't think you can just say, oh, well, we're getting high school graduation rates, to pick one example, close to 100%. Um, it has to be that in combination with what happens next, you know, transition to college, persistence and completion in college. Likewise, with college, um, it's not just are you completing degrees, it's are you transitioning into a career track role with uh, advancement potential and a clear path toward a life of dignity and economic security. Um, so in a weird way, I think you have to judge the K-12 system on what happens five, 10, 20 years after leaving the K-12 system. Now, we actually do have the data tools to do some of this, but we haven't really had the will to use them and to a point that uh, I think I think Phil made earlier. Um, I think it's a fair question as to whether some of these decisions 
are taken to benefit young people who are in the system or the adults who, who, who run the system. But I want to make the systemic point real quickly, because as an individual, you can do everything right uh, and still find yourself approaching midlife without, you know, the outcomes that you were looking for. I think about young people who entered the labor market about 11, 12 years ago, you know, like right in the teeth of the Great Recession and their follow ups who are getting ready to graduate maybe from college this spring. They could have done everything right and the circumstances. Uh, that they're facing are still going to, you know, exert a long-term drag on their outcomes. So that goes back to the point that was just made about political action and kind of taking control to build the sort of society, the, the fairer systems that we want to see. I think you need both. I mean, you know, judging the results of any part of the system in isolation does not give you a, a full or satisfying picture. Yeah. Thanks, David. So, thank you so much. So each of you represent um, uh, folks who have become wildly successful um, and you have navigated whatever system and sector um, you've chosen to lead. Um, there's a question about um, how do thought leaders um, uh, make sure that we're not disenfranchising groups of students or groups of adults and what can you share so that we can level the playing field for access and opportunity? Any closing thoughts in maybe one minute each? Ten seconds. Education, education, education. Thank you, Frank. Yeah. And I will just add, I obviously agree with the importance of education. Um, I'll also dispute that I feel widely successful. Until education really does the job it should, which is making opportunity for everyone, adjusting to every learning style through technology and great teaching, I don't feel widely successful. I feel like we still have a lot to learn, hopefully, the younger people will tell us what they need, speak out, or what kind of learning they really need to thrive, and we will be responsive with great teaching, technology, and openness, and get out of our comfort zone so that everybody can succeed. I might respectfully Thanks. disagree with you, Phil, but David? Yeah. Um... I think a lot of it is making sure that the right people and the representative people are at the table. Uh, you know, we are we are making progress on that front, um, but hopefully that doesn't come off as too much of a self-serving thing to say. I mean, we're we're five white guys having this conversation, and uh, you know, although I, I I I and sort of and sort of like Phil, I mean, I. I'm kind of trying to manage my imposter syndrome sitting here with you guys. Um, so <laughs> so I, I, I appreciate the company and the vote of confidence, but I think the, you know, the more pertinent point is uh, how to make sure that every perspective is represented and that the folks running the system have a gut level connection to the folks the system is designed to serve. Thank you. Andy, do you mind? Uh, yeah, I would just add, yeah, I would add on to what David just said. I think it's about creating the playing field and the opportunities for pro, you know jobs and the idea that of uh, following your passion. I talk to many, many, many students and many young people that join our organization across a you know, broad spectrum of you know cultures and opportunities. And I will tell you, it comes down to creating those opportunities for passion students understanding what their passions are, what they're great at. Because if you plus what you're great at, you'll always succeed. And that's something my father taught me early on in my life, mm. where I, I was a D student. But once I found my passion of architecture and design, I excelled at it. And I think that's the key is finding the personal fire and passion in these young people. Thank you so much. As we welcome uh, Michael Druckmann back on stage, I just wanted to thank all the panelists um, for your wisdom and for carving out time to share with us. Um, 
and thank schools that can because connecting the education to employment pipeline, um, particularly today with the staggering unemployment rates is, is important uh, now as it ever was. So thank you all. Great job, Matt. Thank, thank you, Matt. It was a real pleasure. Thank, thank you, you all. Honored to be with all of you.